So we'll go ahead and get started here in just a second. And while we're waiting for everybody to come back in here, we can start off by doing some practice with some of those Vesper geometries that we were talking about the other day, those geometric shapes that are based around Lewis thought structures. So give this a go. Yeah, so start with your Lewis dot structure. All right, so a reminder of the logic for this type of problem. Each of these individual steps is not that tricky, but putting them all together to go straight from a formula to the geometry, the molecular geometry, and the shape of the molecule is a little trickier. So start by doing your Lewis thought structure. From there, you figure out how many things are taking up space around that central atom. And from the number of things taking up space, that gives you your electron geometry. And remember, that's one of those five basic shapes. There's linear, trigonal, planar. I'll put that, that uh, diagram up here in a second. Um, once you know, and then once you know the electron geometry, then you'd say, okay, well, if I can't see these lone pairs, what's it actually going to look like? And remember, you don't need to write the name. Um, as long as you can draw it with approximate, approximately the right angles and using the wedges and dashes if you need to. So remember that this column is your electron geometry. And our, we're looking at carbonate, which everybody knows the formula for now, right? Everybody has that down. 
the very least you know that it should have an odd or an even charge. An even charge, right? Because carbon's got an even number of electrons, oxygen's an even number of electrons. So carbonate CO3, the two minus charge. Because your total number of electrons is always gonna add up to an even number for this class. And if you totally forgot that on the quiz, you won't forget it again, right? So if we wanna know what the molecular structure is, what the molecular geometry is for carbonate, we start with the Lewis dot structure. So start by counting up electrons and figuring out what goes in the middle. So four electrons plus three times six electrons plus two electrons because it's got a negative two charge. So 24 total. And again, that's total valence electrons. Because once it's not a valence electron, we basically ignore it. If it's not a valence electron, nothing ever, it doesn't ever do anything. So when we're talking about electrons and total electrons, we're almost always talking about valence electrons. Sam? Okay. So three times six is 18, plus four is 22, plus an extra two is 24, right? Unless I'm having a bonehead day like the other day. Does that seem reasonable to everybody? Okay. What goes in the middle out of the carbons and the oxygens? And why? Furthest away from fluorine, most vacancies, least electronegative, those are all valid explanations. So carbon's gonna go in the middle. We know it's got oxygens all around it. So we can start by using six of our electrons to just do that, right? Now we've got 18 electrons left. And how many does each oxygen still need? Six. Six times three is 18. So that'll take up all the rest of our electrons, right? Is everything stable? What do we still need to do? We got to create another bond Y. Because carbon needs eight and it only has six. We're out of electrons. We can't just throw another pair on there. So that means one of the oxygens has to share more than it wants to. So I might as well pick this pair that I drew very poorly anyway and erase them. And that's the key. You have to remember that you have to erase a pair of electrons. If I've used up all the electrons I have and I need to make a double or a triple bond, that means I need to erase a pair of electrons when I do it so that I still have that 24 electrons total to work with, right? It's the two most common places that people mess up with, with Lewis dot structures is usually they either get the wrong number of electrons because they just keep adding lone pairs until everything has eight electrons, but then they don't have the right number of electrons, or they forget to erase a pair when they make a double bond. And you can't have an atom that has, if you're in the second row of the periodic table, we only have S and P orbitals to work with, right? You will never see anything in the second row of the periodic table have more than eight electrons. So if I didn't erase that lone pair and it still looked like this, that oxygen has 10 electrons, right? That's a fundamental flaw. That's one of the biggest mistakes you can make when it comes to Lewis, drawing Lewis dot structures is to give something 10 electrons in the second row of the periodic table. It will never happen. 
when you take OCHEM, anybody who takes OCHEM, um, there is no faster way to put your instructor TA, whoever's grading your papers in a bad mood than to draw a carbon with five bonds. Just point blank, that will just put them in a foul mood and everybody's grade will suffer. So never do that. Oxygens, carbons, fluorines, nitrogens will never have 10 electrons, period. All right, so here's our lowest dot structure. Now everything looks good, right? Did it matter which of the car, which of the oxygens I picked to have the double bond? Why? Sorry. So one of them needs to make a double bond, but the, are is there any difference between the oxygens? I just picked one at random, right? I picked the one that had the lone pair. I didn't like looking at anymore. Um, it turns out really all of the oxygens will take turns making a double bond. And even that's an oversimplification. Really, it's kind of like they make one and a third bonds a piece instead of making having one carbon with a double bond and the other two carbons being single bonds. Um, it's a property called resonance that you spend a lot of time on in OCHEM. Um, but it has to do with the fact that these, these electrons don't really exist in any one position they exist as a cloud of probabilities. Um, you know, if I, the same way that if you have a cat at home right now and your cat is indoors, do you know exactly where your cat is? No, you have a pretty decent idea that the cat is inside the house, right? Maybe if you know the cat well, and you know that there's a really good chance that the cat's sleeping on your bed, but you don't know for sure just like we have a pretty good idea that these electrons have these certain shapes, but we don't know exactly where they are. There's a probability of where you're likely to find these electrons. So that these shapes of these orbitals are kind of like saying, well, I don't know where the, where the electron is, but it's in this general vicinity, probably. Just like you probably know where your cat is, ish. All right. Cats are unpredictable, which is why they make good for good, good thought experiments in quantum mechanics. Schrodinger's cat, same, same deal. Um, if we want to know what the shape of this molecule is, now that we have our Lewis dot structure, what do we do? How do we figure out how many, what the shape will be? How many bonds, and not just bonds, how many things are taking up space? around that central atom, right? Because a lone pair still takes up space, even though it's not a bond. And so that's why I like the, the phrase um, electron domains. And an electron domain can be a lone pair, it can be a bond, it could be a double bond. It's just any area in space where you're likely to find electrons where they're filling up that space. Right? so how many electron domains do we have around this carbon? Three. Oops, that was the eraser, not the. You have three electron domains. That double bond only counts as one electron domain because they're both in the same spot. To go to our cat analogy again, there's three apartments and four cats. How many apartments have cats in them? Three, right? Yeah, sure, two of the cats are stuck in one spot in one apartment, but they're still only occupying one space, right? You know that in our, in our probability function, both of those cats are in the same area, roughly, right? So even though it's a pair, it's two pairs of electrons they are taking their one electron domain. So if we have three things taking up space around the carbon, what's the furthest apart we can get those areas? 120 degrees. So really it's not 90 degrees where I drew it up there. It's more like 120 degrees. 
which has the name trigonal planar. Again, trigonal means triangular, as you might expect, and planar means flat on the same plane. And again, if you didn't remember the name of that electron geometry, drawing it and labeling 120 degrees is totally fine. You just have to show me that you know what the shape is. For some people that think more geometrically, it's easier to just draw it. If you don't think geometrically, or if you've done, if you do enough practice, it winds up eventually being easier to just have the names memorized. Just like instead of trying to explain what a triangle is every time, it's easier to just have the word triangle, right? I could say, well, it's this shape where all the sides are connected and there's three shape or three sides and three vertices, or I could remember the word triangle, right? These are weirder names or names you're not as familiar with, but same logic. You do this enough, you're just gonna have them memorized anyway. That said, I told you the last thing I was gonna just tell you straight out memorize was polyatomic ions. So I'm not gonna make you memorize this. It just might be easier than trying to draw it every time. It could be an upside down triangle. These are three dimensional objects that exist in whatever way, whatever way they are. So the same way that, you know, a six sided die can, it's still a, the same shape regardless of which way it's arranged, which way it's oriented, which way you draw it, it's still the same cube shape. Same is true for these. They're three dimensional objects that can move around and spin around if you draw in any orientation you like. But at that whole time, no matter how you draw it, you're gonna keep those oxygens 120 degrees from each other. All right, and so this week's lab that has you playing with these geometries, um, in on a computer screen, you can grab a hold of one of these oxygens and drag it over here and watch how everything else moves around it. And what will always happen is that they'll wind up, if I drag grab this oxygen and I move it that way, everything else moves, shifts back to the same shape, right? Because the whole point is these things are trying to avoid each other and stay as far apart as possible. There was a person at a dance club that you were trying to avoid and stay as far away from as possible. And they walked over to your side of the dance floor. You walk to their side of the dance floor, right? It just automatically arranges, rearranges itself to try and avoid um, getting these electrons too close together. <laughs> Maybe you need to change your cologne. That was a good joke though, I like that. It's like somebody who wears, wears cologne. Sometimes people will naturally try and stay away from them. That works. All right, if we're dealing with sulfur dioxide, not a polyatomic ion, just SO2, no charge. Reminds me of the old chemistry joke. Mm -hmm. A neutron walks into a bar and orders a beer. The bartender pours him a beer. And the neutron says, what do I owe you? And the bartender says, for you, no charge. But um, So sulfur dioxide, we have to start with the Lewis dot structure. What goes in the middle? Sulfur. They both have the same number of vacancies, but sulfur is farther away from fluorine. So sulfur is going to go in the middle. Sulfur has uh, six valence electrons, and there are two oxygens that each have six valence electrons, total of 18 valence electrons. You can start by using four of them up like that. 14 left. How many does each oxygen need? Six, and there's two of them. So that's gonna use 12 of our 14 remaining, right? I 
And remember drawing these little loops is a convenient way to keep your electrons from bleeding into each other to keep track of how many you have. Now we're down to two electrons left. Well, they can't go on oxygen, right? Because that would give an atom from the second row of the periodic table, 10 electrons. That's an, a big no-no. So they go to sulfur, which works anyway, because the sulfur still needs to get to a full valence, right? We're out of electrons. Are we stable yet? We still need one more pair of electrons to move over to the sulfur, right? So pick a, pick a lone pair and, and erase it, turn it into an extra bond. Is everything satisfied? For now, we'll learn that this is not the best Lewis dot structure we can draw, but we'll save that for Gen Chem. This is a good enough Lewis dot structure for now. So how many things do we have taking up space? Three. There's three things taking up space, only two that we can see. So there's an electron domain, there's an electron domain, there's an electron domain. There's still electrons, right? And electrons push away other electrons. So they're still pushing away those other electrons, even though there's no nucleus on the other side. So three electron domains, what's our electron geometry? What shape is that gonna be? Trigonal planar. So it's gonna look like this. It's roughly 120 degrees still. So that's what we call the electron geometry. The electron geometry is trigonal planar. To go back to that other figure here, this first column where you just count up your number of electron domains your electron geometry is always gonna be something out of that first column. And then we say, okay, and now you can't see any, any lone pairs, any electrons that are not part of a bond. You can't see them, but they still take up space. So this is the next most common mistake people make is they, they think, okay, well, I've got three things taking up space. My electron geometry is trigonal planar but I can only see two of them, therefore it's linear. That's not the case. Just because you can't see those electrons doesn't mean they're not pushing on the other bonds. So it's still three electron domains, but one of them is invisible. Which means we're looking at that geometry. Our molecular geometry is bent. And they also put angular on this figure. I've never heard anybody call it angular before. Everybody always calls it bent. Right, and so that's why when you go back here, it's Lewis dot structures to get your number of electron domains to get to your electron geometry which is sometimes the same as your molecular geometry. For our carbonate example, carbonate had three electron domains and you could see all of them, which means it's electron geometry and it's molecular geometry are the same. The only time they're different is if one of those things taking up space is a lone pair. And again, it's one of those things about chemistry where we get really nitpicky about the language because once you get the hang of it, it makes really easy to communicate some pretty complicated ideas. If I can just say it's trigonal planar electron geometry rather than having to draw it out every time. Um, and we try to avoid confusing people as much as it doesn't feel like that sometimes. The point is to avoid confusion 
once you understand the rules. It's getting to that once you understand the rules that's confusing on its own sometimes. What do we do for methanol, CH3OH? What's our central atom going to be? So then we can just surround it with everything else, right? H, 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 O. Can we do that? I'm hearing murmurs. No, why not? I gave that carbon too many bonds, right? The organic chemistry cardinal sin. You never give carbon more than four bonds, but we have five atoms. So what do we do with that? But if we just split it further down, what do you mean by that? So like this? What if we made some of the carbon or one of the bonds go on to an oxygen instead of a carbon? Does this work? Let's count our valence electrons first. We didn't do that to start with. Get four from the carbon plus four times one for the hydrogens gives us eight plus another six for the oxygens, right? So eight and six is 14. We just used five, 10. We just used 10 of them, right? So four electrons left. Well, that looks a lot different than what we've been drawing, but it follows all of our rules, doesn't it? Everything's got us full valence. Nothing's overfilled. We use the right number of electrons. What does that do as far as geometry goes? This is the right Lewis dot structure. This is perfect. But how do we decide how many electron domains there are? How many things are taking up space around the center atom? What's the center atom? Carbon? Why isn't the oxygen a center atom? Because it's closer to fluorine. True. But if I if I drew it like, so let's look at it from two different perspectives. We think of the carbon as the center atom. We've got four electron groups around the carbon, right? Well, what about if we drew it like this? We could just as easily say, well, the oxygen's really the center atom, couldn't we? Are they both center atoms? Do we have to pick one of them to be the center atom? They both have groups of electrons around them, right? If they both have groups of electrons around them taking up space, they're each gonna have their own sort of geometry going on, right? The carbon's got a geometry where you've got four electron domains, which would make it, what's our general shape there, our electron geometry. Yeah, when we have four things taking up space, it's tetrahedral electron geometry. So the point I'm trying to make here is that if you have other lone pairs around other atoms, that doesn't affect counting your number of electron domains. We're talking about around a single atom at a time. If you have more than one atom that has things attached to it, that's fine. It just means you're gonna have more than one electron geometry. There's an electron geometry for the carbon, there's electron geometry for the oxygen. What's our molecular geometry? 
for the carbon. Same, right? No lone pairs means it's also tetrahedral. What's our electron geometry for the oxygen? How many things taking up space around the oxygen? Four, so also tetrahedral, right? What's our molecular geometry? There's two lone pairs that we can't see. So not linear, because it's still four things taking up space. And that's exactly, I'm really glad somebody said that because that's exactly the point I'm trying to make. We don't, once you define what row you're in, in this chart, unless you change where your electrons are, you're never gonna change rows. Your molecular geometry will be in the same row. So it's still tetrahedral electron geometry, but you have the two lone pairs. So it's bent just like water. So you would wind up with every, every atom that has a bond beyond just hydrogen, really, if you have more than just one pair of electrons, everything has a geometry to it. It's just a matter of what are we considering the central atom for right now and for drawing it a certain way. So for instance, if we wanted to draw this molecule with the carbon being the central atom, and you wanted to draw it with the wedges and dashes to show the shape, we could draw the tetrahedral shape looking like that, right? I could just as easily draw oxygen as a central atom and have a lone pair going into the board and a lone pair coming out of the board. Those are both tetrahedral electron geometries. So when we use the word molecular geometry, it's almost a bit misleading because it's not the geometry of the whole molecule. The geometry of the whole molecule is all of these individual geometries sort of stuck together. Just like every individual Lego piece has its own shape and then you combine them, right? When you combine them, you don't change the shape of the Lego piece. You put them all together to get at something that looks different that's made up of all the individual pieces. And so just to to show this, so if we wanted to draw this molecule here, we can. Oops. And draw the Lewis dot structure. You don't need to worry about showing lone pairs for this program. And it'll show it in three dimensions. We can actually have it rearrange that so it looks a little bit better too. The carbon is the gray one on the right hand side. It's still tetrahedral. The oxygen's on the left. It's still bent. When you put the whole thing together though, you get a different overall shape for the molecule, All right? So when we're talking about molecular geometry, we're talking about for one individual atom, but that doesn't give us the whole story on the shape of that molecule as a whole, because every atom in that molecule has its own molecular geometry. And when you put them together, you get the total shape of the molecule. If we want to know, if we want to see it closer to what the actual electrons look like, they look more like this. You can't see the bonds that way, but you can kind of still see that if you imagine having a nucleus right in the middle of this gray sphere, there are four things attached to it roughly at 109 degrees from each other, right? So the molecular geometry of the whole molecule is the sum of all the individual pieces. And if you wanted to, this is actually kind of a fun program to play around with. It's just called MolView. 
Um, you can, it actually just has a search bar. You can, don't have to build a molecule by hand and you can even put in things like proteins. You wanna look at the structure of myoglobin. It helps if you spell it right, but it also does guess pretty well. And you can get the shape of the entire of myoglobin and see what it looks like and what the various atoms are and what's going on. Or caffeine, which is the one that it started by showing us. It's its default. The caffeine looks like that. So it's kind of fun to just play around with. Yeah, that's the one I wanted. All right. So questions on these Vesper geometries. If you're feeling particularly lost and you haven't worked on the lab yet, the lab should make some of these concepts a little bit more clear because you get to build some of these structures yourself and play around with them and see what, what they look like in three dimensions. Oh, all right. So let's... let's we let, this makes a good convenient place. We'll take a break, take 10 minutes, come back at 10 after, and we'll talk about reactions. Yep. I'll take it. Thank you. That's what they're there for, right? Managers? I guess. Thank you. 
literally my boss has told me I will get you a raise if you don't get the fuck off. You guys have done that? Yeah. Oh, that's That's why I like when they're in the junk cooks, they're going to get my and it's like, stay going. I'm about to kick your ass back in like two, four, five seconds. You leave where you go. Oh, I look for What's that? You have an appetite. Uh, not that has staples in it. Rum runners are, are delicious. Yeah, but they've got so much alcohol. It's so dangerous. They're the best bang for your buck in the South Shore. Yeah, pretty much. Especially with my bartender. They just hold the rum on top of it and then they just kind of lose track. That's how you get those tips. Uh-huh. Just get everyone trash. Mm -hmm. And then wait for Matt to kick them out. I live for it. Someone spit on Bruce last year. Yeah, that was great. And then another guy tried to beat up me and Bruce. Yet I had my page around and everything. I was ready. It's like, this guy's a six foot fucking wall of a man. I'll get out of here. Yeah, that's his post. And we were arguing. <laughs> It's a restaurant on a national park, so it's reasonable prices for the view, and it's right on the water. It's like oh. one of two places that you can actually like get a meal right on the water, right? And the other ones all charged through the nose. There, I guess yeah. If you go in all the way over there, there's the landing. Oh, there's there's Riva or Boathouse. On the water, but I'm like right on. Right. No, it's like your de the deck is mm -hmm. on on the beach. Yep. Like in the middle of July when it's hot as hell after your shift, you can like jump over the lake. Right. right it's it's really nice, but the, the low price point means that you attract everybody. Degenerates. Yeah. POSs. <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> the people I'm who look for the too. best and for the cheapest drinks. <laughs> It's a good place to watch a Giants game in the weekday, weekday, weekday nights. It's a, it's a pretty nice place to go sit, enjoy a sunset, drink a rum runner, watch, watch some baseball and then leave. Oh, no. I'm a Giants fan. I'm a baseball fan in general, but especially at Giants. Good deal. I 
I was really hoping they were going to go with the Cleveland Spiders. That would be cool. Yeah. yeah. But I guess Guardians, that's more. It still sounds mostly like the Indians. Yeah. Guardians. Okay, so this one. The next one. All right. Let's go ahead and bring back here. No, I don't have any more All right. So, no, stop. Go away. All right, so now that we understand how compounds work to some extent, we're learning how compounds work, how formulas and, and uh, molecular weights and everything work. Now we can start to talk about what happens when compounds change from one compound to another compound, All right? And so we can't destroy the matter. We can't just get rid of atoms but we can rearrange atoms. We can change how they're connected to go from one type of compound to another. Right? And so that's what we call a chemical reaction. A chemical reaction is anytime you start with things in one state, then you wind up with the same atoms rearranged somehow. Um, and they, we write them out in a really intuitive way. Um, this reaction arrow right in the middle is a lot like an equal sign, but it's kind of, it's an equal sign that also implies time. I'll, we'll explain why, I, why it's also like an equal sign in a minute, but it's basically a before and after, all right? And so that, that reaction arrow always says, okay, here's what we started with on the left and it's turning into what we have on the right. So here's an example, and I don't know why this is automatically animated like this, but it is. So um, the terms that we use to describe these uh, reactions is whatever you're starting with, whatever is doing the reacting, we call it a reactant, although sometimes the term reagent is still used as well. So that's your before picture. What you have beforehand is your reactant. What you have afterwards is your product makes sense. It's what you're producing, right? It's what the reaction is making. So reactants and products, then you have your reaction arrow as well. And that's just what separates the before from the after. These other pieces at the bottom are a way of conveying extra information. In addition to telling us what compound we have, it also tells us what phase the compound is in. And by phase, I mean like the like phase of matter, solid, liquid, gas, right? And so that allows us a lot of flexibility with how we write this. We can basically describe any change as a chemical reaction. Sometimes, and even some things that we would normally consider a physical change, like water melting, can be written as a chemical reaction. And there are some reasons why we might do that because there's some other tools that you'll learn about in terms of energy um, and in terms of, of predicting how close to completion a reaction will go, um, where it's advantageous to be able to write a physical change as though it was a chemical reaction. And so what I mean by that is if I had something like H2O solid turning into H2O liquid, that's a physical change. All I just wrote was I wrote ice melting as though it was a chemical reaction. Solid water turns to liquid water. There are advantages to writing things like that sometimes. So this, this system of writing reactants and products and using a reaction arrow winds up having a lot of use in science as a whole because we deal a lot in science with cause and effect, right? 
Cause and effect means you've got a before and an after. So it winds up being a lot of places where we can use similar logic um, once, you, once you get the hang of, of using this. The only th one of these that is really tricky is that we add an additional phase. We don't typically write plasma as an option because plasma or supercritical fluid is not a common phase on earth under the conditions we're working in. So we don't usually, I don't even know if you would write like P or something like that. Actually, you would probably write it as parentheses SC for supercritical because you can do things like use supercritical um, CO2 as a solvent for extracting organic material. That's how they decaffeinate coffee beans and tea leaves. When you make decaf coffee, you take, it's a, not quite a liquid or a gas. It's you take CO2 as a plasma basically and use that to extract out caffeine um, along with some other flavor compounds, which is why decaf doesn't quite taste the same. Um, but it's such a rare case that we don't usually even bother with that writing supercritical fluid or, or um, plasma as a phase. We do, however, have aqueous. And as we remembered from last week from nomenclature, aqueous was what we was one of the hints that we had an acid, right? Basically, it just means dissolved in water. So it's a, because that's such a common thing on Earth, we have a special a special um, way to delineate when you have something dissolved in water. If we lived on a different planet where maybe ammonia was more common than water, we might have, and that was the, the universal solvent that you saw all over the place in nature, then we might have a special subscript to denote dissolved in ammonia instead. That's not the case on earth. So us, us with our earth centric viewpoint, we're gonna use aqueous. Um, but that's literally all it means, dissolved in water. So it, that also means we can write reactions that are pretty straightforward, like you can say sodium chloride as a solid turns into sodium chloride aqueous. So what did I just describe? Dissolving it in water, taking a handful of salt and putting it in a pot of water and it dissolves. It seems like when I say something like, okay, write the chemical reaction for salt dissolving in water, it seems like water should have to be part of the equation, right? It's not though, because just that aqueous symbol is all you need to say dissolved in water. If you tried to write water as a reactant, water liquid plus sodium chloride solid, you still have the same amount of water on the other side, right? The water didn't really change. It's still water. So we would just write plus H2O liquid still over here. And if you have the same thing before and after a reaction, did it really change? No. So in that case, we would just wind up being able to effectively cancel out from both sides. You can treat this, like I said, you can treat that reaction arrow a lot like an, uh, an equal sign in algebra. Say, okay, well, if I have the same thing on both sides of, a, of an algebra expression, you can just subtract it from both sides without changing anything, right? So anything that shows up as both a reactant and a product, we can just cancel it out. All right. If we can have chemical elements that are neither created nor destroyed, what does that tell us about this reaction? We, it means that there's something wrong here, right? Because we have four carbon atoms on the left-hand side and only one carbon atom on the right-hand side. Right, so in other words, this arrow isn't really an equal sign yet. In order to be able to treat it like an equal sign, we need it to be the same on both sides. Right, in other words, all four of these carbons have to go somewhere. So they have to show up in, one, we have to have at least four carbons show up in our products. Right, and so that process is called balancing. 
So balancing the reaction just means that we're gonna change how many molecules we have of each type until we have the right number of atoms before and after. The same number of atoms before and after. And so we can't just do that though. Why can't we do that? Because now it's not carbon dioxide anymore. We just changed what that molecule was by changing the subscript. So if this is the reaction that says butane, which is C4H10, reacts with oxygen to make CO2 and water, we can't change, once we have those things written, we can't change what any of those compounds are. All we can do is change how many of each compound we have. So if we can't change the formula for CO2, how do we get four carbons? Four CO2s, every CO2 has, two, has one carbon, right? So if I have four CO2s, I used up all four of my carbons. Seems obvious enough, right? Now I have more oxygens because that means I have four times two oxygens now just from CO2. Did I see a hand over here? Okay. So it's always, it's a bit of guess and check. There's, there's logic to it, Victoria. we're not creating so much as we're saying, we're accounting for, it's almost like bookkeeping. It's, it's not rewriting, it's because we're not changing what the compound is, we're just changing how many we could make. So it's a little bit like saying, okay, if I'm gonna put my car through a reaction where I turn it into all of its constituent pieces and I have a four door car, if I take one car and I take all of the pieces off of it, I have four doors, right? I'm not, I didn't create those doors. The doors were part of the original compound. I just took them and I separated them out. So that's why it's, we need to make sure if I said, okay, I took apart my car and I only have one door as a product. That starts getting a little bit weirder, right? Because where the other three doors go. That's what we're doing is we're making sure that everything that we started with is accounted for on the product side. But sometimes that does make some weirdness happen, like we just changed how many oxygens we have now, right? So and maybe a better analogy is it's a little bit like doing a, making a recipe where you, if I say, okay, I'm gonna make three batches of cookies, how many eggs do I need? Well, if I'm making three, I have to work backwards, right? To figure out how many eggs I have to start with if I wanna end with three batches of cookies. So we're gonna kind of go back and forth and change how many of everything we have, but we're not gonna change what each object is. So what else is not balanced? Our oxygens aren't balanced. Our hydrogens aren't balanced either, right? How would we balance the hydrogens? Five. Yeah, if we start with 10 hydrogens and we, all of our hydrogens turn into water, Right, there's no other molecule on the right hand side that has hydrogen in it, right? So I have 10 hydrogen atoms and they're all turning into water that has two hydrogens per atom, per molecule. So I must need five waters total. Now we're missing even more oxygens, right? Why is that wrong though? What did you notice in? we're off by one right so just like thinking about charges on the polyatomic ions you can say oh well it always needs to be even right so that kind of allows you to to figure th some things out we can only add o2 the only way we have adding adding oxygens is by adding an even number of oxygens on the left hand side right so if the only way we have of adding oxygen is adding even oxygens, the fact that we have 11 oxygens 
actually it's 13 oxygens, isn't it? 13 oxygens on the product side is a problem because there's no number that we could put there that would give us 13. Go up by one, what do you mean by that? We could do seven O2s, but then where'd the extra oxygen go? So what we can do instead, so, and this is something that, that seems counterintuitive to people. If you have an odd number and you wanna make it an even number, you can either add one to it, but that doesn't work in this case because we have one extra oxygen unaccounted for, or you just double everything. Before we said, okay, if we have, if we have one CH, C4H10, we can make four and five respectively. Well, if we doubled all of those numbers, it's the carbons and hydrogens are still balanced, aren't they? Or you can think of it as, I'm just gonna erase everything and start over and I'm gonna put a two. So, okay, well, if one doesn't do it, let's start with two of these. Now, how many CO2s do we make? We have eight carbons now, so we can make eight CO2s. And now we have a total of 20 hydrogens. So how many waters can we make? 10. Now, how many oxygen atoms do we have on the right side total? So eight times two is 16 plus 10 times one. Now it's an even number. So how many O2 molecules do we need? 26 over two. Now, if we look at any atom or every atom, we should have the same number on both sides. We have eight carbons on the left. We have eight carbons on the right. We have 20 hydrogens on the left. We have 20 hydrogens on the right. We have 13 oxygens, sorry, 26 oxygens on the left and 26 oxygens on the right. Now it's balanced and we can say that the before and the after are equal to each other. And this takes practice. And we're not really breaking the rules because we didn't change what we have or what we're making, just what ratio we're making it in. Right? If I started with a different car, if I started with a two-door car and I disassemble it into its pieces, I'd have a different number of doors at the end, right? Because I started from a different place. That didn't break any rules. It's all about just making sure whatever you start with is accounted for and whatever you're making came from somewhere as well, right? And if you do that, we wind up with a balanced reaction where we can say what everything we started for is accounted, accounted for. Everything we started with is accounted for. There's a bunch of dangling prepositions there too, but I don't think anybody cares anymore in terms of English. Everything with which you start is accounted for, I don't even know how you would structure that. That sentence just needs to get tossed if I'm gonna to try to actually make it grammatically correct. So let's ignore that. So by adding those numbers in the front, we're not changing what the atoms are, just how many of everything we have. And that's, those are called coefficients. So it's a little bit like, like when you're doing algebra, when you have something inside parentheses, right? And then if you want to know how many, like if you had X plus four and you had three in front of it, you could distribute that three, right? That works the same way with the subscripts. If you have two as your coefficient, that means you've got two times four carbons and two times 10 hydrogens. Right? It's really similar to doing algebra in a lot of ways. So let's practice. How do we balance these reactions?
So what do we do for this first one? <laughs> so it's sometimes it's really hard to know where to start, right? Where did you start, Amigo? I started with You know, you've got to have at least a two there, right? It could be more than that if you have more than one water, but it's got to be at least a two. If we say, okay, let's assume we start with one water. That actually does it right there, doesn't it? So sometimes knowing where to start is half the battle because if you do that, you say, okay, well, if I got hydrogens here, two hydrogens, two hydrogens, which means I've got a total of five chlorines on the right. I've got a total of five chlorines on the left. I've got one phosphorus on the left, one phosphorus on the right, one oxygen on the left, one oxygen on the right. So as complicated as this one looks, it actually balances pretty easily. And so one of the, and you could start from a variety of places in this case too, because the, the way that I would look at this is basically anything that you have in two different forms on as a reactant or two different forms as a product is going to be really hard to balance sometimes. It's like chlorine, you don't necessarily want to start with chlorine because chlorine is in two different forms of product, right? So figuring out what the ratio is of these relative to each other is going to throw off how many chlorines we need to start with over there too. So anytime you've got the same atom in two different compounds, either as a product or a reactant, don't touch that one yet. Because if you balance all the ones that only show up in one place, then a lot of times the tricky ones take care of themselves. So if you just started with phosphorus, okay, well, I've got one phosphorus here, one phosphorus there, we're good. Then I look at chlorine. Chlorine, I've got in two places over there. I don't want to mess with that yet, so I'm just going to ignore it for now. Then I look at water and say, okay, well, water, hydrogen only shows up in one place there, so let's get our hydrogens work. And then let's check oxygens. Now everything's good and the chlorines took care of themselves. How'd the second one go? Anybody make it through the second one yet? Yeah. So if we have, when we balance the hydrogens, we have to put a two here. And that counts for the hydrogen and the chlorine, that whole molecule we have two of. So that gives a total of five chlorines on the right, five on the left. If I'm remembering right, this one might be a tricky one. I think B is a tricky one. It's doable with the approach we just talked about. Let's see. It's fun for me to try and remember all my keyboard shortcuts. Three, two, aqueous, and H2O. All right, so where do we where do we start here? It's got a lot of stuff involved, right? So 
So we start with the ones that only show up in one place. Might as well start on the left-hand side. Although it doesn't really get us anywhere, right? Because copper, and copper, copper's already balanced. So maybe that's helpful, maybe it's not. What else? Where else can we start? We don't definitely want to start with nitrogen. Nitrogen shows up in two places. Oxygen shows up in two places. So what can we do? Let's do hydrogen. See where that gets us. We know we have to have at least two there. That would get us one over here, right? Is that gonna stand up though? What's wrong with that? Well, nitrogen and oxygen are still wrong. What do we know about nitrogens? How many nitrogens do we know we have to have at least on the left? Well, we've got two nitrogens there and one nitrogen there. So we have to have at least three nitrogens on the left-hand side, right? So can we put it three there? No. Why not? Because then it messes with the water. How does it mess with the water? It's an odd number of hydrogens and we only have an even number of hydrogens on the right. So that means that this has to be an even number and it has to be at least three. So let's try four. See what that does. That changes our, our waters over here to be a two. Why? There's a so two times three is six, seven, eight, nine, ten now oxygens. Oxygens only show up in one place over here, right? So yeah, you're exactly right. Our oxygens have to be a multiple of three as well. So we got a lot of different constraints here. So it kind of, you almost have to guess and check a little bit. Okay, well, four is not gonna work because that messes with our oxygens. So what could we do? We know it has to be even. That's gonna give us a total of six times three is 18 oxygens. And we know that six of them have to be over here as water. Sorry, three of them. If we're only dealing with multiples of three, we've got three oxygens here. That's already going to be a multiple of three. What do we have to do over here to make this number of oxygens a multiple of three? You can't just do a one. You can't do a two. We can do a three. Now at least we know that all of our oxygens on the right hand side is a multiple of three. And that gives us two times three is six, seven, eight, nine, and three times two is another six, so 15. That doesn't work either, right? So we keep going. With it's, we know it still has to be an even number, right? We could go eight. That would give us four oxygens over here. Let's see what that does. Oh, we need, we need these oxygens to add up to a multiple of three. So we have four of them as waters. You could conceivably have two of them as NO2. We need a total of how many? Four. 
24. We're not going to get very far without changing this to some extent, right? We're going to have to change our carbons or our, our coppers at some point. So, or put this as two, four, two there. Who found the solution? It used to be four, two, and two. Oh, four on the left side. Four right here? Yeah. Like does give us a, something that's divisible by three for our total oxygen. So we maybe went down a bit of a rabbit hole trying to make every one of them divisible by three, but we need the total to be divisible by three. Hydrogens work, oxygens work. Four times three is 12. There's six of them. There's two. You know, so that gets, so our oxygen's good here. <laughs> copper is still good. We didn't mess with copper yet. Nitrogen's work? Yeah, I think so. So sometimes these can get really tricky. Sometimes they're really easy. It's as easy as just putting two in one spot or even just looking at it and say, it's already balanced. Sometimes you've got to get in there and adjust some things. And this is about as difficult as it will get. The reason I like this one as an example, even early on is not to try and overwhelm you, but to, this is as hard as it gets. And you'll only get better at this the more practice you get. What about C? After that one, C feels easy, right? Yeah, you have two, two hydrogens and two iodines on the left. So you know you have to have at least a two there. It's already balanced just by doing that. If you don't have a coefficient written, you can assume it's one. Just like if you have X plus four in parentheses, you don't have to write one in front of it, right? It's implied that there's a one there. So that's balance already. What do we do for Fe and O2 making iron three oxide? Why do we need two on the product side? can't get O3, odds and evens. So it can get really tricky when you try to incorporate things beyond like when you start looking at multiples of three, like we saw, but odds and evens hold, hold up, especially when you only are making a single product. We know there has to be an, we have to have an even number of products because we can't get O3 any other way. So with that in mind, We can balance oxygens and we can balance irons. So the same way that you wanna leave anything that shows up in two different products, you wanna leave that till the end. Anything that, that, um, that is all by itself where we can change how many irons we have without changing anything else, leave that to the end too, right? Because you can, we can put as many irons as we want without messing with anything else we already balanced. Right, so it makes some sense to leave the pure substances alone to the very end and just make them whatever they need to be. That's kind of what we did with the oxygen on the, on the first one, right? We did the carbons and the hydrogens first, and then we said, okay, now we can change oxygens without messing with anything else. All right.
We'll do this. I'm going to show you this. This is going to be a case of we'll look at it once and then we'll look at it again on Monday because you're going to need to see this more than once. So let's get the first one right now. Um, so the this next section is is tricky partly because there's so many different options. Right. So a lot of times when you try and define types of chemical reactions, you wind up with with textbooks that um, intro textbooks that use words like synthesis or decomposition or single replacement or double replacement. Those kind of describe what ha are happening, but the problem is there's no standardization. Different textbooks define these different reactions differently. And if you go on and take other chemistry classes or other science classes, they're going to have their own classification system. Um, this is another from another intro level textbook that says, okay, well, chemical reactions are either precipitation reactions, acid base reactions, gas evolution, oxidation reduction, or combustion reactions. They're describing the same or the same reactions that the first chart did. And then if you go further and you look, you can break it down further. You have addition, decomposition, or neutralization. Or you can have substitution. These are, this is how you, you classify reactions in organic chemistry. You can have substitutions, additions, or eliminations. And you can have nucleophilic, electrophilic, or radical. Like, those are all true. If you take a biochem class, you get oxidoreductase reactions. You get transferase reactions or hydrolase reactions. All of this to say there's not a whole lot of standardization. So the way that we're going to approach it in this class is at its very most basic, which is reactions either transfer electrons or they don't. Right? And that's what we're going to use as our primary distinction for classifying this. As you get further in, into science classes, you'll wind up with other classification systems that are more important in whatever field you go into. That's fine. We're just starting at its most basic. Electrons transfer between nuclei or they don't. All chemical reactions fit into one of those two categories. It's a nice thing about having a binary classification system, right? It fits or it doesn't. It has to be one of those two options. Right. And so what we call the when you transfer electrons between nuclei, we call that an oxidation reduction reaction, which is also frequently abbreviated redox. A redox reaction means that you moved electrons from one place to another. And it's called oxidation reduction because you really have two things happening at the same time. Something is losing electrons, which we call oxidation, and something is gaining electrons, which means its charge is reduced. If it's not a redox reaction, I put everything else into sort of a basket that I just call a complexation reaction. You're changing how things are, are stuck together, but you're not changing what they are. If you started with nitrates at the end, at the beginning, you still have nitrates at the end. But if you take start with nitrates and you turn that nitrate into a nitrogen dioxide, you changed where the electrons are to do that. And that makes it a redox reaction, right? So these complexation, I'm not in love with that term. It's not all that universal, but it's, it's the, it is universal in the sense that it applies to everything else is just different ways of arranging the same pieces. Um, whereas redox reactions are melting down your Legos and casting them into new pieces. Right, and so recognizing those is tricky and we will practice that on Monday. Don't forget to take the quiz this weekend. The online quiz.